I loved Mario Kart as a kid. I think it was the first video game I actually remember getting for Christmas. Hey, look at that, I was pretty cute. And I can't tell you how many hours I pumped into battle mode with friends. But there was another kart racer on the N64 that I never gave a proper chance when I was younger. And now I realize what a shame that was, because this game blows Mario Kart out of the water in basically every conceivable aspect. Diddy Kong Racing is the perfect example of Rareware in its heyday. They took a stellar concept from another Nintendo hit and cranked it up to 11 in terms of creativity, challenge, and sheer content. Oh, and you know, in addition to making countless other classics at the same time. Not only does Diddy's first spin-off title have a ton of charm, feature other rare characters, and have some of the best music on the system, but it also innovated in five main areas to bring this relatively static genre into new territory. The first of which being the most foundational, having an overworld. It's clear from the start that Rare didn't want to just make a racing game. They wanted to build an adventure around kart racing. There's a full-on story here with a villain and heroes trying to stop him, so it only made sense that instead of picking which track you'd like to play from a list on the menu, they designed a fully-fledged hub world to navigate. Simply having an open field to test out your driving abilities is cool enough, similar to Mario 64's castle exterior. But there's a lot more going on here than just entering levels. To unlock new tracks, you have to gather balloons from winning races, but you can also find hidden ones around the various locales. It wants you to explore. I love how the music changes as you enter new biomes too, that's a great touch. There's different characters to interact with, like TT the Clock for time trials, and Taj the Genie who is definitely something. He'll even want to race you himself on occasion. And this is a great way to test out the second thing Diddy Kong included to set it apart. Multiple vehicles. You don't just drive cars in this game, you also pilot hovercrafts and airplanes, and they all control vastly different from each other. Carts can drift easily, but slow down if they get caught in hazards, while hovercrafts, though a little slower, can ride on water and have exceptional turning. But if you'd rather take to the air, planes are super versatile and can even perform tricks. But if you hit a wall, it takes more time to recover. Each have their own benefits depending on the situation, and you can try out different ones to completely change how you progress through levels. It makes for some great replayability. Mario Kart did add gliding and underwater sections later in the series, but they're always in short bursts and don't really change the gameplay all that much. Diddy Kong gave you tons of options over 20 years ago. I also like how there's more depth in terms of boosting here. It's more than just pressing A on the starting line. If you let go of the gas right before you enter a zipper, you'll get an extra blast of speed than if you'd held it down normally. This seems a little overpowered at first, but becomes necessary in some of the later challenges. Furthermore, they completely revamped how items work by adding synergies with each other. At first glance, it might seem like Diddy Kong Racing has less to offer in terms of the different types of items you can use, but you quickly realize that they can stack on top of each other to increase their power. So a quick missile operates much like a green shell, but if you collect two in a row, it becomes a homing shot. And if you get three, it gives you ten missiles to launch at a foe. The same is true of all the different item colors, increasing your boosts, longer lasting protective barriers, or even more unforgiving traps to lay. While Mario Kart may have a bit more variety in this department, I think they designed it this way on purpose because there's way more strategy and planning around which items you collect. Instead of being random, you know what you're going to get every time here. And the fact that grabbing a different colored balloon lowers your item back down to the first tier means you have to be careful about which route you'll take as it can change your effectiveness on the battlefield. This is especially important in the fourth edition Diddy Kong brought to the table, boss fights. That's right, there's so much more going on than Grand Prix style races. After completing four of them, you'll go head to head against various bosses that have some really interesting voices. Well done. Now I challenge you to race. Hey, no judgment. I like that each race is totally different. You'll go up a winding mountain, down icy slopes, and even around an island, avoiding frickin' bubbles. This guy sucks! These baddies are far from pushovers, and you even have to face them again in a much harder rematch to proceed. It took a lot of effort and restraint to not break my controller, but I finally bested them to unlock the final fight against Whizpig. And this guy is no joke. You basically have to hit every single boost perfectly to even stand a chance at beating him. There's no items, no margin for error, just all out skill to win here. But when you do come out victorious, you realize the fifth thing that makes Diddy Kong Racing unique is what Rareware does best. Tons of secrets and bonus content. 
So beating Whizpig is far from the real ending. Here's all the stuff jam packed into your adventure to face him a second time. First off, you need to win four trophy races. But to get those, you'll have to beat the boss of each area, then complete these silver coin challenges, which require you to collect eight coins during a race and still come in first place, then beat the boss again, and now you can try for the trophy cup, taking on all the area's tracks in a tournament. Doing this four times lets you blast off in a lighthouse that was secretly a rocket ship the whole time to unlock the final bonus world with the hardest races yet, bringing our total track count to 20. Beating the silver coin challenges in these levels would unlock the final whiz pig fight, except that there's one more catch. You need to find the hidden keys in each world to open their challenge rooms. I don't know how they did it, but they turned a racing game into a collectathon. Rare, you maniacs. These are some of the neatest tasks, too. You'll go from gathering and hatching eggs, to an all out battle royale, and even a banana treasure hunt. It's insanely creative, and a nice break from the heart pounding action. So then you can face Whizpig again, but oh, you thought that was the end? Ha! Child's Play. Now you got Adventure 2, baby, with reversed courses and harder AI. And this is all without mentioning the unlockable characters, ghost races, and cheat codes to personalize your experience. This is ludicrous. I can't believe they packed this much stuff onto a cartridge, and on a limited time crunch, no less, to get it out for the holidays in 1997. At the end of the day, if there's one thing Mario Kart does better, it's multiplayer content. You can input a code to play adventure mode in co-op, but duking it out on block fort definitely is the top of the line. That being said, even Mario Kart itself has deviated from that style of gameplay in its more recent titles, and it just hasn't been the same since. Is Diddy Kong Racing rough around the edges? Sure. The overworld is clever, but it is a little bare bones, and the N64 could only have so much power back in the day. It doesn't have the best frame rate. But this is all the more reason why it would be incredible if we saw a sequel. Just imagine what Nintendo could be capable of on the Switch. Now, obviously, the chances of this are pretty slim. Rare doesn't make games for Nindy anymore, and even if they did, the team that was there in the 90s have moved on to greener pastures. Our best bet would be to see a new studio take on the franchise, but I would hope it's one that understands Rare's commitment to charm, and piles in secrets and goodies galore, all wrapped up in a satisfying challenge. Retro Studios has done a phenomenal job with the Country series. I think I could get behind- wait a minute. Hmm. One can dream. As I said, I missed out on this game as a kid, but I didn't realize it's actually the 8th best selling game on the N64. If you played it, what was your favorite memory from the game? And if they ever did make another Diddy Kong Racing style adventure, what would you like to see in it? Let me know in the comments below and let's talk about it. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty, my friends. Hey guys, so I just wanted to be candid with you real quick about the future of Donkey Kong Month. This is our sixth year covering DK content, and if I'm being honest, I've sort of covered everything I want to talk about with the series. I think all we have left is spin-off titles until we get a new Donkey Kong game or something, so for the sake of keeping it alive, because I know people love DK Month, this is going to be the only video for it this year. That being said, I am planning on streaming DKC2 speedruns over on Twitch for the rest of the month, and also if you have other Donkey Kong topics you'd like to see me talk about in a video, let me know and maybe we'll cover it in the future. I hope you understand and I also hope to see you at a future stream. Follow at twitch.tv slash snowmangaming and I'll see you there. This month's Patreon shoutout goes to Freezing the Mind because he's just so kind it'll blow your mind.